crap. Good afternoon, friends. I'd like to welcome you to What's in Tegan's Storage Locker. It's the show that dares to ask the question, just what is in my storage locker? The answer today, well, friendo, the answer is comic books. The answer is always going to be comic books. I grab a fistful of comic books from around. We look through them here on the screen uh, for your entertainment, edification, education, however you want to put it. Now, the first thing I'd like to do is to point you in the direction of the Patreon if you like this show, if you like any of my shows, if you like my new show, Hey Tegan, What's in the Bag, uh, where I look at new comic books. Uh, the Patreon is uh, where and how you show uh, your appreciation. I got tons of writing, my writing, from my decades-long writing career available for you to download instantly. But let's get going here with uh, Who's Who, Volume 2, from 1985. This uh, was the first Who's Who series, uh, technically issue two, not issue two of volume one of Who's Who. They would do later edition of who, Who's Who. And this was the DC's first attempt at uh, trying something along the lines of uh, Marvel's official handbook. We've looked at an issue or two of Who's Who, and we've looked at an issue or two of the handbook in the past as well. So you know uh, by now uh, the drill. Who's Who is a little bit looser. Uh, they, uh, the editorial standards are a bit less of the, uh, how do we put it, like fake government document that you get with the official handbook. Uh, so you, you get to see the characters' uh, logos, uh, and you get to see a really nice cross-section of interesting artists doing uh, the entries, which is something that Who's Who shares with uh, the official handbook of the Marvel Universe, but I think Who's Who uh, definitely eclipsed uh, the older series on that score, because uh, just flipping through this when I was getting ready to record today, I realized that every single one of these issues of the original run of Who's Who is just absolutely packed to a degree that just boggles the modern mind. So, like, off the bat, we got this uh, George Perez cover. Now, George Perez, I don't remember off the top of my head how many of the original covers he did. He did not end up doing the original run because, remember, this ran concurrent with the original Crisis on Infinite Earths. So, George Perez was... Um, he was a bit busy, shall we say. So it, it makes sense that he was not able to draw all of them. But he was able to draw this one. And I think he may even have a couple, uh, he may even have a uh, entry or two inside. Uh, so we got a editor's uh, essay by Marv Wolfman and Len Wein. Those are the two people who more or less put this together along with uh, Robert Greenberger. Mike Barr, Gary Cohn, Peter Sanderson, one of the big wheels research for research at both Marvel and DC, and uh, E. Nelson Bridwell as well, a famous name in DC, and Todd Klein, responsible for the production here. Uh, just an absolute star-studded cast of creators to put something together that is really... Uh, a labor of love from every single person uh, concerned here. So, uh, yeah, they get some really obscure phases here, like Auto Man. This is a piece by Alex Saviak, Romeo Tangal. You might know Alex Saviak for doing a very long run on Web of Spider-Man in the late 80s, early 90s. Azrael, this is a, a Latter-day Teen Titans character. This is a piece by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, Romeo Tangal again. And uh, this style here of, of the figure in front and then the color hold background, uh, some artists really use that to good effect here. Like <laughs> page three, Joe Kubert, Balloon Buster. Not necessarily one of their, their more favorite not necessarily one of their bigger war heroes, 
but uh, definitely a striking piece by Joe Kubert, Eduardo Barreto, drawing Babe, who was, if you've never heard of this character, which you probably haven't if you're under 50, because they were a member of the Atari Force. And the Atari Force was, in the early mid-80s, one of the biggest DC books. And of course, uh, no one today knows it at all because it was technically a licensed book from Atari, even if none of the characters or, well, hello. Have you come here to lament the passing of Atari Force? Anyway, as I was saying, even though uh, the book really only started off with a, a very glancing relationship to any IP that they got from uh, the Atari video game company, technically still those characters and books are owned lock, stock, and barrel by Atari, and I have absolutely no idea who owns Atari in 2024. I know that they still exist as some kind of legal entity, but I have no idea if anyone at DC has ever even thought of going down the rabbit hole of, of trying to get those books, even just reprinted. But I will say, we live in a world where Marvel has put out uh, new omnibus reprints of Micronauts and ROM, so... Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. But when it comes to Atari Force, I will definitely believe it when I see it. Uh, Baron Bedlam, he, he's a Batman and the Outsiders heavy. So this is a nice Jim Aparo piece here for a you know rather forgettable you know Outsiders villain. Rick Hoberg and Romeo Tangal on Baron Blitzkrieg. He's a Looks like he premiered in World's Finest Comics 246. So, now I, I I don't even know if I've ever even read a comic book with this man in it. Baron Winters, this is the guy. I guess he first appeared in a, I want to say a preview in New Teen Titans 21. But uh, his big book was Night Force, which was, uh, it was the big reunion between... Uh, Marv Wolfman and Gene Colan in the 80s at DC, you know, the team from Tomb of Dracula at Marvel in the 70s. But it didn't, it didn't go very far, although I think this guy still has shown up periodically in various, you know, magic-oriented books. Ron Randall drawing uh, The Barren Earth, which is uh, one of the, I guess the, this was something that premiered in an issue of Warlord, but I want to say this was a limited series that didn't, uh, go very far, although you can sort of see an echo of the later Ron Randall uh, character Trekker there in that design. Oh, it's the Batcave by Harold Bender and Gary Martin. Very classic looking Batcave with all your different, uh, uh, you know, your giant penny and your dinosaur and your Joker card. Uh, you don't have the the Hall of the, the Costumes, which I guess was something they really um, pushed in later years, especially when they had Jason Todd's uh, costume there. Uh, Batgirl by Brent Anderson and Terry Austin. Interesting matchup right there. Really in the twilight of the era of the original Batgirl, just, uh, I think, two years left for her after uh, this printing. Batlash by Dave Gibbons. Not a creator who's associated with that character, but if you got Dave Gibbons on the horn and <laughs> you're going to get him to draw anyone, I guess get him to draw Batlash. Maybe Nick Carty wasn't answering his phone that day, but I'm not complaining. Uh, they probably could have got Sergio Argones to do it for that matter. Uh, the Classic Batman by Dave Gibbons as well. Uh, if you want to see more Dave Gibbons Batman, the book you want is uh, Brave and the Bold 200, which is the last issue of the Brave and the Bold, but it's a team-up, sort of a team-up, between the Earth-1 and the Earth-2 Batman. And this is the Earth-2 Batman, who is, even though it's Earth-2, it's the first Batman who premiered in Detective Comics 27. You flip the page here, you see... Batman of Earth One, who, according to the, uh, you know, encyclopedists, pr first premiered in Detective Comics, three twenty-seven, which was the dawn of the, uh, the new look, 
the circle chest Batman. So one restriction that this volume of Who's Who had, you'll notice that most of these entries, they're all um, a single page, which for a character like Batman, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you could have printed that a little bit bigger if you'd done a two-page spread there. Uh, Dick Giordano and Mike DiCarlo drawing the Batmobile and the utility belt, which get their own the, the different Batmobiles here. I love the, the, the Batmobile with the, the bat-faced scoop on the front of it. They even brought that back uh, for a little bit in the 90s, if I recall correctly, because this new car was out, so he was driving around the old one. Uh, the Bat Plane, another Dick Giordano, Mike DiCarlo. And Marshall Rogers giving us Bat Might, who was not necessarily a character who was getting a lot of play, in the uh, mid 80s but uh he was a big player in the batman books in the uh you know in the 60s i think late i don't know if he premiered in the late 50s but certainly in the early 60s it was, it was his heyday and then they they backed away from batmite and then he made a strange resurgence in the uh very late 80s and legends or the early 90s in legends of the dark knight with kevin o'neill and he's shown up periodically ever since Batwoman, another Dick Giordano, who uh, is a character who would uh, definitely uh, go away for a while and then come. We read an issue of the, the current Batwoman uh, a, couple issue, a couple episodes back, the J.H. Uh, Williams III Batwoman. Beautiful Dreamer, one of the forever people, uh, by Jack Kirby and Greg Theakston. He did all of the entries for his characters in the who's who so you know you're at least going to get one or two jack kirby pieces in every issue of the classic who's who speak of the devil ben boxer and big barda man jack kirby understood the significance the importance of alliteration to comic book names he uh that wasn't all stan lee he, kirby kirby knew how to do that my goodness. Nice pieces. Nice pieces. Big Bear, there you go. That's one, two, three. That's not alliteration, but three double B names from Jack Kirby. Honestly, uh, having all these double B names, maybe someone should have said something, but I don't know. Who's going to say anything? Carmen Infantino and Klaus Janssen giving us Big Sur, who was a late addition, way late in the Flash 338, uh, to, the fla to the classic Barry Allen Rogues Gallery. But he has appeared since then because this guy was uh, later on a member of the Injustice League that appeared in the uh, Bwahaha, you know, Keith Giffen, James de Matisse incarnation of the Justice League. So he ended up being in the Justice League Antarctica. Uh, Bizarro World by Kurt Swan and Carl Kiesel. And Speak of the Devil, Kevin O'Neill gives us Bizarro. Fantastic. There you go. Kurt Swan, Kevin O'Neill on the same spread. There's no other series in history that's going to do that. But who's who? Oh, Black Briar, Briar Thorn. This was a new character because he just premiered in this uh, DC Comics Presents 66, which uh, is actually an issue that we've looked at on the TikTok because it's Joker and Superman against, you know, this Joker here, who I think his gimmick is he's a, a druid of some kind. Black Bison, Bison from Fury of Firestorm. I'm trying to remember, was he? Yeah, I guess he was a Firestorm villain. Uh, Black Condor by Jerry Ordway. And my goodness, this guy, if you know anything about the original Black Condor, you know this fella is just an absolute gomer. But he's never looked better here than drawn by Jerry Ordway. Yeah, I know who he was drawn by in the Golden Age. This is Jerry Ordway we're talking about here. And we get a double entry for the two Black Canaries by Terry Austin. 
uh, in the classic canary costume and the, the costume that she was wearing in the Justice League at this point uh, in her history. Uh, and that right there is some very complicated continuity because the Earth 2 and the Earth 1 Black Canaries were sort of the same character. <laughs> one of them was the mother, one of them was the daughter, but one of them went over from one Earth to the other in the middle there. And then later on, after Crisis, they're going to do some really crazy stuff and make her uh, one of the founding members of the Justice League, which uh, some people still probably bristle at the very mention of. Black Hand by Gil Kane. Black Fire by George Perez. My goodness. Just right there. We are eating well, folks. That's a nice George Perez uh, piece of a character who I really uh, could go the rest of my life without ever reading another story about this person. Again, it's the new Teen Titans. Just ain't my bag. My goodness. Gil Kane. Still showing them all how it's done. Black Hawk by Dave Cockrum. Black Hawks by Dave Cockrum. They didn't get Dan Spiegel to do this. That's interesting because Dan Spiegel was, uh, he was the guy who had drawn the most recent uh, Blackhawk series. Now, Cockrum did do some covers for that volume of Blackhawk that had the Dan Spiegel art, but uh, man, those Dan Spiegel Blackhawk, we've read an issue of that on the TikTok. One of DC's best looking books from the entire decade, straight up. And Blackhawk Island and the Blackhawk Plain, also by Dave Cockerman and Murphy Anderson. Uh, I wonder if Lady Blackhawk gets her own uh, entry. Lady Blackhawk is the one who is still stuck around. And in the very last page, you get to see where all of these folks most recently shown up, if indeed <laughs> they have most recently uh, shown up, because there's a few of these folks who probably this was their last appearance, like Otto Man, I can't remember the last time he showed up. I think this Azrael gets trotted, has been trotted out since then, but Balloon Buster? There haven't been a lot of Balloon Buster series. He appears in Crisis on Infinite Earths for like a panel. Everyone appears in Crisis on Infinite Earths for a panel. Black Hand actually ended up being a a big deal in the, um, you know, black uh, Blackest Night cycle of stories. Man. Nice stuff. Nice stuff. Speaking of nice stuff, Infinity War number four. These uh, all had double gatefold covers by Ron Lim, because Ron Lim did the whole of the Infinity War. Ron Lim only did two and a half issues of the original Infinity Gauntlet because George Perez was the original artist on Infinity Gauntlet, and uh, he overcommitted to do uh, this at the set, to do the Infinity Gauntlet at the same time as uh, War of the Gods. Now, he made the decision in the moment to finish War of Gods and to let someone else finish Infinity Gauntlet because uh, I've read interviews where, where he said that he just did not care for the story in Infinity Gauntlet very much. He thought it was redundant, but in hindsight, I really wish he had finished Infinity Gauntlet as opposed to War of the Gods, which is uh, maybe uh, not everyone's favorite DC crossover, whereas Infinity Gauntlet has definitely uh, stood the test of time. As to Infinity War, well, that's a whole different kettle of fish altogether. Still got, uh, still selling football cards here, limited edition. Uh, Ripen, Ripen, how do you pronounce that? Is that Mark, Super Bowl MVP Mark Ripen? I don't know how to pronounce that name at all, but he was apparently a big deal. And I remember they were pushing Charleston Chews here for a while. Marvel Collector's Edition presents Wolverine. You get this special comic if you send in your uh, wrappers. And I don't think I did that. 
because I'm lame. What can I say? So, as I said, the Infinity War was all Ron Lim all the time with Al Milgram on inks. So it looked pretty decent. It was, however, uh, nowhere near as good as the original Infinity Gauntlet, straight up. Uh, and Infinity uh, Crusade, was, and they, I'd say both Crusade and War were probably about the same, and neither of them were a patch on the original Infinity Gauntlet. You could definitely tell that, uh, you know, they weren't uh, stories that Jim Starlin necessarily uh, pulled out of his hat. Uh, he put the foundation for them in the gauntlet so that the sequels were ready. Uh, they made sense. They, they built on what had come before, but they just they weren't that good. They were kind of, um, you know, uh, the thing with the Infinity Book stories, at least the original Jim Starlin ones, I'm not talking about the movies, I'm talking about the original Jim Starlin ones, is that ultimately they're Thanos and Warlock stories that all of the other superheroes are shoehorned into. And Infinity War actually does a better job of shoehorning the superheroes than Infinity Gauntlet, because Infinity Gauntlet, the original Infinity Gauntlet, the story actually <laughs> seems to have to stretch just to fit in, like, you know, Spider-Man and Wolverine. Whereas here, you know, they, they're a big deal from the beginning that uh, it's about the Magus here. He figures out his plan depends on taking all of the superheroes off the board because he's seen in the past like Thanos he underestimates all the Earth superheroes so he's going to go after the superheroes first thing and the way he figures out to do that is uh, by making magic evil twins to kill them all so that's why the gimmick of the original Infinity War the real Infinity War except no substitutes is uh, everyone has to fight their evil twins and a couple of the evil twins even ended up sticking around. Spider-Man had an evil twin uh, who ended up falling into Carnage's orbit and was a part of the Maximum Carnage series, and I think uh, still showed up uh, a couple times, at least in the new century, if I recall correctly. Uh, I want to say one or two more of them showed up, but I'm trying to remember. But the point was, uh, essentially that all the superheroes got to have evil twin versions that had, you know, sharp teeth and were, you know, super badass. So just based upon that explanation, uh, you can tell it's going to be a lot more fighting uh, because all the superheroes get involved and they have to go cruising through the dimensions to try to track down the Magus, that's, that's the guy who is uh, Adam Warlock's evil twin. And the third series, The Infinity Crusade, is about Adam Warlock's good twin because Adam Warlock, uh, he's just that kind of guy. So, oh, okay, I, I skipped a page there. So here is uh, half the superheroes who are still on Earth having to fight all these evil twins. So you got all the X-Men who did not show up. Famously, the X-Men were not a part of the original Infinity Gauntlet, except for Cyclops and Wolverine, because the X-Office had no faith whatsoever that uh, Infinity Gauntlet was going to be a thing. So they said, okay, you can use two of our guys. So they picked Cyclops and Wolverine. Infinity Gauntlet turned out to be something of a sensation. So uh, when time came for the second Infinity series, Marvel said, okay, you can use the X-Men for this. So here's Beast, here's Gambit, here's Multiple Man and Wolfsbane uh, alongside, you know, U.S. Agent and Moon Knight and Puck and Black Knight, all these characters who don't necessarily usually get to you know, appear alongside the X-Men, but this was all hands on deck because Marvel knew Infinity War was probably going to move some copies because uh, the Infinity Saga had proven itself commercially. So, uh, yeah, they're all fighting evil twins. So there's an evil Puck and an evil Darkhawk, <laughs> an evil Namorita, 
And here's the other half of the heroes, because they split uh, the heroes in two. Half of them are still st sticking around the Fantastic Four's headquarters uh, while it's being overrun with uh, evil twins, while the other half of the heroes, the more powerful ver set of heroes, uh, are going, tripping down the dimensions, looking to try and find the Magus. And what has happened is that they have run across Adam Warlock and the Infinity Watch, including Thanos, and they see Thanos, uh, and they don't trust Warlock. They, they do not trust Warlock at any point in any of these stories. So they see Thanos, they see Warlock, they're like, okay, uh, maybe we need to um, fight these people. And the rest of the Inf Infinity Watch is along for the ride. Now, Gamora, she's probably uh, knows uh, what to do in this instance, but, you know, you got Pip the Troll, and, you know, poor Drax, this is back when he's got brain damage and he's bigger than the Hulk. Uh, nothing like the Drax that you know, if you do not know this Drax. Uh, this Drax gets, uh, gets uh, the short end of the stick, shall we speak, because uh, the new Drax, although he's been that way for like 20 years, so calling him the new Drax at this point uh, shows my age more than anything else. Uh, but the new Drax was so popular and people embraced it so much that this version of the character has just been completely memory hold. Uh, when the point was, when he was brought back in the early 90s, uh, the original Drax died in the 70s, and when they brought him back, he had been dead, so he had brain damage. And so this, this character explicitly has brain damage. He's got, he doesn't remember anything about any of his past lives at all. In fact, I want to say in an early episode, we may have looked at an issue of the Infinity Watch, because we had a few issues of the Infinity Watch in the pile in the early episodes. And we were looking at uh, him going up against the Hulk when he was remembering some of his early memories, because he's technically Moon Dragon's father. So Moon Dragon's fighting Psylocke, and you got Havoc, and there's Rogue, uh, Ron Lim drawing Rogue for you. Uh, Professor X is even involved. They brought Professor X out on the out on the road here, which you know, Professor X doesn't always get to go out on the road, so this was probably a treat for him to you know get to meet all these people. I mean, how often do you see Professor X and Thanos facing off? Not very dang often, because Professor X has a better sense of self-preservation <laughs> than to get in the same room with this man. Uh, and, of course, you got Thanos, the... I'm not going to... This is one of the more clever parts of the story, because Thanos has an evil twin who's basically just another version of Thanos, uh, hanging out with the Magus here. And the other plot thread is Doctor Doom is after the Magus, because Doctor Doom has figured out that the Magus has... Uh, amassed a great deal of cosmic power, and he was more or less just a bystander to the original Infinity Gauntlet story. So he he's getting in early this time around. He's all about going through time, the, the, the time stream and the dimensions and trying to sneak up on the Magus so he can um, get whatever the power is. And he's got Kang along for the ride, because he doesn't respect Kang, but he knows Kang can get through these dimensions uh, quicker than he can. Castlevania IV. And I was never really into the Castlevanias for some reason. I think I rented like, Castlevania II on the NES, and I just didn't get very far in it. And there's yet another plot thread with Galactus, who is also after the Magus. Uh, and he is working with the surfer, that's his herald at the time, Nova. And his big move is basically, uh, he goes and gets Doctor Strange. First, th first things first, uh, Galactus goes and gets Doctor Strange off the board to be his helper. Because he knows that Doctor Strange is one of the most powerful uh, pieces on the board. And he's using Doctor Strange's mystic insight 
to navigate the dimensional barrier to try and find, because everyone's after uh, the Magus. They all know Magus is the problem, and they're all in a race to get to him first. Marvel Universe Series 3, I'd argue this was the last of the, the classic uh, era of the, the Marvel cards, the first three series, all good after that, diminishing returns down the line. These three series and the first Jim Lee, X-Men, uh, if you're looking for any of the cards, those are the ones. Everything since then, with the possible exception of the first Marvel Masterworks by Joe Jusco, that's, that's pretty much the essential stuff from that, that movement of trading cards right there. I still have all of those in the, uh, in the storage locker, but they're under stuff. <laughs> so we may well see them one day, but they're under stuff. So, meanwhile, back at the ranch, everyone's still fighting evil twins. Here's Hank Pym making, a, making some kind of move. Good Lord, he's figured something out. They're all still fighting. So you see, this uh, Infinity War number four, it has a lot of fighting in it. Uh, but it has Rogue, which the first Infinity Gauntlet does not have. And the problem is, is uh, there are too many people fighting in a very small space, so they all start hitting each other. Uh, Gamora kicks Rogue into She-Hulk's fist, which is, you know, that's, that's how Gamora fights. She uses her uh, enemy's strength uh, against each other. This is back when Gamora was, was still cool as opposed to the version of Gamora that they try to sell kids nowadays. Not that I'm bitter about those versions of the characters being so popular or anything. Uh, I mean, you can't say Jim Starlin. They didn't give him plenty of chances to do stories with those characters, and some of those stories ended up being the Infinity War. They can't all be winners, folks. So there's Strong Guy, who takes up most of the panel whenever he appears. Yeah, and like Cyclops, Wolverine, Strong Guy, Heather Hudson, Vindicator. It's taken four of them just to, you know, get one hit in on Gamora. So, you know, she's, she's a good fighter, you could say. Wolverine, not with your claws. And, of course, Pip the Troll pops in with a rock. <laughs> Hits Wolverine with a rock. Oh, Tasmania. Sort of off to the side of the, the Tiny Toons and the um, Animaniacs, both of which were Amblin. This, uh, the Tasmania cartoon was not, I don't think, an, I don't think it was an Amblin uh, joint but also it might have been. It wasn't related story-wise to those. It had a whole different setup. He had, his, he had a family living in Tasmania that, that we got to meet, and it was, it was kind of interesting. It broke the fourth wall quite a bit for a uh, Saturday morning cartoon. But once you hear the song to, to Tasmania, the cartoon, you will never get that one out of your head. So yeah, lots of fighting. Here's Black Knight uh, killing Daredevil's evil twin. <laughs> the evil speedball. Yeah, they really, everyone, everyone got an evil twin for the Infinity War. And here looks like Doctor Doom. He's wearing his Secret Wars, a modified version of his Secret Wars getup without the cape. Him and Kang are the first to stumble into the uh, Magus's lair. Towards the tail end of the, the TSR, uh, being a force of, you know, selling ads in Marvel Comics, uh, selling, the, selling the books, the R.A. Salvatore books, for the uh, Forgotten Realm setting, which I understand is still still popular. Uh, Walden books, man. Walden books. It was not a good bookstore, but compared to what bookstores look like now, it was a balm in Gilead. 
Yeah, he uh, there's this module that I think is filled with cosmic cubes, if I recall correctly. And this ends up being um, in the third story in the Infinity Crusade, uh, the goddess who is the Adam Warlock's good twin ends up getting her hand on 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 this source of power right here. Oh, and Galactus shows up just in time to to stop this fight because Earth's heroes have finally managed to take everyone out of the fight except for Thanos, Warlock, and Drax. Uh, although, honestly, you know, Rogue could have probably one shot at Thanos if they let her. They, they don't. They, they just... They, they wanted to let everyone else feel like they were contributing. Five cosmic cubes. So you have two cubes and three other different shapes here. Uh, I choose to believe my head canon is that this is the Lord Leviathan from Hellraiser, whose ascension cosmic cube turned evil. There you go. Uh, Galactus is just sitting around talking about what's going on. Your comrades have been saved. Now may we return to the business at hand. When these evil twins die, they all turn into these weird um, uh, alien tentacle creature things because that's where uh, the Magus got them from. He found a weird dimension filled with tentacle beasts and he turned them into evil twins. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you could have done more with the evil twins, but this set up here where everyone was just fighting all the time, and you know, there, there are worse, or there are better setups for crossovers. There's Wolverine's evil twin. Uh, trying to remember what, if we see Rogue, we must see Rogue's evil twin at some point. Uh, so, yeah, they're all just sitting around catching up on the plot, which is always a big deal in the Infinity Cycle. Any real Infinity story is going to have long stretches where uh, Thanos just sits around telling people what, what is happening. And when they actually have the fight between the two Thanoses, the, the Thanos Eye, uh, it's an, an issue of, uh, I, I want to say we've even looked at it on this channel here a long time ago. It's one of the better parts of this uh, rather underwhelming crossover. Uh, and, oh yeah, there's they're doing something weird with Earth. wonder if they're even aware of what's happening back on Earth. This is the Eric Masters and Thor. If you're wondering Thor's wa why Thor is wearing this mask outfit here so yeah it's time once again to construct reconstruct the infinity gauntlet because uh they they know that they're they're going up against uh the magus and the magus has a lot of power and he gets them all back together and nothing. Well, of course. Because the Living Tribunal told them they can no longer work in unison, which was subsequently disregarded by various creators. If you're wondering, you know, because uh, the Infinity Gauntlet shows up at the very beginning of, you know, Jonathan Hickman's build up to uh, Secret Wars and his new Avengers, and it, it's working fine there without any. Uh, reference to why the Living Tribunal's uh, judgment was was altered. God forbid they actually explain something that happens in one of those comic books. You know, a, a, a narrative caption in a Jonathan Hickman comic book? Dogs and cats. Jeez. So... Uh, the Magus and Thanos show up to kidnap Adam Warlock because they want the gauntlet, even if it ain't working now. Yep.
That's a nice line. We can stomp Thanos. This whole mess was probably his doing anyhow. Hulk, I had heard rumors that you were no longer an unthinking brute. It would appear those reports were in error. Otherwise you may might otherwise you would realize that I may well be your reality's only chance for salvation. Where were we before we were so rudely interrupted? Okay, so exposition, exposition. Uh, Adam Warlock is at the mercy of his evil twin and Thanos' other twin. <laughs> oh, now Thanos has the ultimate nullifier. And he gives it to Quasar. And this ends up being, I think, Quasar's second or third death. Because uh, he dies in the Infinity Gauntlet, he dies in the Infinity War, he dies in his own book. So he dies like three times in the space of about a year. And eventually that sort of became <laughs> part of the gimmick. Uh, and later on, it, for subsequent Quasar appearances, just him not really being able to die is, is part of the, the whole shtick inexplicably because he just he keeps dying and he keeps coming back and this this is what this is what i'm all about here is the living tribunal in eternity sitting around and having a coffee clash that's just about my favorite thing in all of comics galactus i am ready to consider your case present it well for your dimension and its very existence may depend on the outcome of this hearing love it Hudson Hawk, licensed in better times. That's a chunky uh, subscription form, but it would get worse. Coming soon, the, the 2099 books and Fish Police. I need to find the, the Marvel run of Fish Police. That, that's one I need to track down. All right. About some Gen 13, not just any Gen 13, the Gary Frank Gen 13, because, yes, it had been too long since we had seen anything from the team of uh, Gary Frank and Cam Smith. And you know, if I am about anything in this world, I am all about Frank and Smith. And this is uh, John Arcudi's run as writer. Uh, actually, just the other day on the TikTok, uh, reading the Savage Tales, that magazine has uh, John Arcudi's, I want to say, if I recall correctly, his very first comic book writing credit in Savage Tales. That is a massively star-studded magazine, really significant in terms of the number of uh, really unique appearances, first appearances, only Marvel appearances uh, by a number of really big-name creators. John Arcudi is one of them. So, I do not remember at all what was happening in this book at this time. I don't have a full set of this run, even though I have a, a fair amount of it. But uh, this is uh, obviously long after the original creators have uh, passed on. Uh, you know, J. Scott Campbell, he's doing, where's the actual, I think it, yeah, John Arcudi, Gary Frank, Cam Smith, Wildstorm FX, uh, Colors, Amy Grenier, and Denise Park on Letters. So, uh, J. Scott Campbell, he's doing Danger Girl by now for Cliffhanger. So, uh, this book is, uh, on to subsequent creative teams. And frankly, I think it is uh, one of the lost opportunities uh, in comics that this set of characters just didn't really make it past uh, their initial run. Because uh, th this creative team is certainly a top shelf creative team. This is after Gary Frank had already done The Hulk. 
he was already, uh, and Supergirl, so he was already a, a big name. And for some reason, this run just, I think this was one of a number of runs that just kind of got swallowed up in the, the Wildstorm uh, purchase uh, by DC, which really just messed with the whole line. And sadly, I don't think there's any part of the Wildstorm line that you can say benefited from being swallowed up by the, the greater DC um, organism. All these characters were just put out to pasture. No one wanted, you know, and it's not like they didn't try. The problem was is they kept putting out uh, reboot after reboot of the Wildstorm books in the 2000s with diminished return after diminished return until people were finally just sick of it, like we are not going to read the authority. We are just not going to do it. If you can't even get Grant Morrison to write more than two issues of the authority, maybe you need to pack it in and acknowledge that that property is gone. It is just in the past. Oh, a firefighter video game. Roscoe McQueen Firefighter Extreme for the PlayStation 1. Head Rush. Oh, hilarious twisted trivia action from Sierra. Don't see Sierra very often anymore. So they're dealing with a large child here. <laughs> they try to strap this child to a, a, a girl. It looks like a stretcher so they can carry it. You know, the kid wakes up. He just breaks the ropes. Watch out, he's awake and angry. So he apparently speaks like an adult. Hey, he's gonna cry. I most certainly am not, which isn't to say I wouldn't have good reason if I were of a more sensitive nature. Binding me, striking me, I don't know who you ruffian freaks are. But if you don't take me back to my lab immediately, I can promise you trouble. So, yeah, apparently there was a hurricane. So they're in some sort of tropical aisle, which is why Fairchild is uh, dressed uh, for a tropical aisle. Dressed like, uh, I want to say Ursula Andress. <laughs> uh, so... An old guy, mad scientist, who figures out how to make himself young again, but also a giant baby. Okay. <laughs> That's fun. Plum Crazy. Extreme Aerial Racing. Oh, Plain Crazy. Plain Crazy. That, does not, that logo does not scan right there. Oh boy, Lost in Space. And they've since done another Lost in Space. Ugh, my goodness. So yeah, if they, if they can't reverse the process, he's just going to keep getting bigger. Uh, Grunge is wearing a pixie shirt, which by 1998 was probably not the most uh, up-to-the-date reference there. At least it's the lo it's the right logo though. Uh, so what else? More than a thousand miles away, where things are less weird. Supporting Castle. Yeah. We're in the first blush of the PlayStation One, putting a lot of money into the comic book coffers right here. Video game ads. They need video game ads again. And role-playing game ads. TSR needs to spin back off of Hasbro so they can actually make money again and give some of that money to Marvel in the form of advertising. <laughs>
they need to figure out. You know, if you look at the magazines that are still on the racks, you see, you know, fashion magazines, women's magazines, art magazines, that figure out how to make ads uh, part of the value so that if you pick up, you know, a fashion magazine, the ads are going to be fashion ads that you're going to want to see if, if you're in that market. Whereas the comic books never quite figured out that whole bag. So they're doing something or other. Well, I'd say it's pretty unlikely. You'll soon forget the name of Gideon Spunktree. Man, I just love Gary Frank's art. Wildstorm News. Oh, we'll come back to that. Oh, and the Mechanic Devolution Tour. Joe Chodo and Jonathan Peterson. That's an interesting matchup there. Looks like uh, lots of appearances in California. These are all California shops. And then Washington, Michigan, Arizona, and two Arizona shops. That doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, then they're moving on from this adventure and on to whatever happens next month. All right. And our first letter is none other than Augie de Blake, who I think is still around in some capacity or other online. I haven't exchanged words with Augie in a long time. We were never close or anything, but certainly we were, uh, we've been on the internet almost as long since the internet's been a thing just about. My goodness. UK Ralph via the internet. Uh, and of course, the, the, if you look at the ratio here, you see that uh, Gen 13 has female readers writing in. Madeline Spaz Bustamante. Leela Tzu. It was definitely a book that, that had a wide audience, which is why it's a shame that they just could not make it with these characters after the 90s were over. And they made a go. One volume had Gail Simone. Uh, the end of this volume has an Adam Warren run, which is kind of hard to find now because just about everything Adam Warren has ever touched is hard to find in the back issue bins. And... If you flip it over here, history in the making, you get a preview of uh, Planetary, Warren Ellis and John Cassidy. I want to say this is an exclusive short story. Man, we did not know how big a deal these characters were going to be for Adam Kubert. Because this, this ended up being finished and pretty much, I can say without reservation, uh, even if you're not inclined to go around reading a lot of Warren Ellis comics in the 21st century, Planetary is still something to see because it is, hands down, John Cassidy's finest hour. And, you know, towards the end, it was a book that was taking a long time to come out. The last run of Planetary took years to get out a handful of issues because he was putting his all into, the, into every bit of it. And it's still, you know, I don't necessarily um, care for, for later Cassidy. I, I think he, uh, he loses something. The, the further into the 2000s you get. And you can definitely see, looking back at uh, his work in the late 90s here for Wildstorm, he was in a category by himself, just straight up. That's why this is still a book worth reading for his part of it. All right, so the Wildstorm News. 
their version of the bullpen bulletins. September releases. Yep, you got the first three cliffhangers series, Battle Chasers, Crimson, Danger Girl, all up to five, although they did not all ship their fifth issues in the same month. This is very optimistic, extraordinarily optimistic of Wildstorm here. Uh, Dark Child is at uh, Majesty Graphics, which I guess was another of their sub-imprints. Uh, Homage Comics is putting out uh, the Astro City, the family album at this point. Maybe this is an off month for the, the Astro City series because they were at Image up to the turn of the up to the turn of the century when they I want to say they go over to DC with Wildstorm. And Divine Right, which was one of Jim Lee's la his last attempt at a new Wildstorm book before the DC switch switch over. DV8's up to 22, Gen 13's up to 33. That's what we're looking at. Jim Lee's C23. I don't remember that at all. Maybe that had some Jim Lee art on it as well. They were doing Resident Evil books, although I don't think this series had any uh, traction because I don't think Resident Evil was uh, stuck around in the comics. Stormwatch. This is the run of Stormwatch that will uh, become the authority. Uh, very soon, because, yeah, this is mid-98. Mid very soon here, uh, Stormwatch is going to have a crossover with the aliens from the 20th Century Fox movie Alien, and they're going to kill all the members of Stormwatch, and then the couple survivors will uh, switch over to being uh, in a group called The Authority. Yes. As we told you last month, Comic-Con International, San Diego, which just started this month, or this week, as I'm speaking right now, was held in the middle of August right here in our own hometown. The show was a blast with huge enthusiastic crowds. Attendance was estimated at 44,000. If you didn't make it, just imagine being in a room with that many fans of comics, animation, movies, games, etc. It's pretty mind-boggling. And you should start making plans now to be part of the fun next year, because you know Wildstorm will be there in a big way. I've never been to San Diego. I, uh, I, I swore years ago that I would not uh, bother going to the, that convention until they invited me, and they have not invited me, so, you know. Uh, who are these photos of? There's Travis Charest with Scott Lamdell's arm and colorful shirt, because Scott Lamdell always wore colorful shirts. Uh, the Resident Evil creators... With Lee Bermejo. So I guess Lee Bermejo is working, uh, doing some early work. I know Lee Bermejo was doing early work for Wildstorm, but he was apparently on their Resident Evil book. And, uh, yeah. Fun stuff. Just about the end of an era here. All right. So we got through three books, but one of them was a giant size, and one of them had Batman in it and Thanos, so, you know. Got our pandering in for the episode. If you like this uh, show, please uh, stick around the channel. I got a new uh, show up. It's called Hey Tegan, What's in the Bag? Where pretty much every week we look at my bag when I come home from the comic book store and you can see all the thing. Well, some of what I bought. Brand new out this week as well is... The uh, Comics Journal Yearbook Best of 2023, which has features on the Comics Journal's best comics of 2023, including essays and interviews by some of the best writers currently working in comics, including yours truly, writing on Dan Klaus. So if you want to see me writing about an artist, I quite like, but have uh, not really spent a lot of time reading, uh, writing about in the past. Here you go. Fresh in stores, eleven ninety nine American, new essay by yours truly, and a bunch of people uh, who are also very good writers as well. Edited by Gary Groth, Austin English, Christy Valenti. So. 
Look for that in stores right this second. Uh, what else? Check out my Patreon. If you like anything I do, any of my writing, any of my shows, any of my reviews, that's how you show your appreciation for me. Uh, there's tons of my writing there for you to download right this second, up for you, waiting at the Patreon. What else? I put up daily comic book reviews on TikTok and Instagram. I have a podcast with Claire Napier called Utter Madness, where we talk about Top Cow Comics. We just put up a brand new show talking about the brand new Witchblade number one. Uh, because I contain multitudes. Uh, what else is there? And I got a new review. I finally turned, as of this video, I finally turned in a new review uh, to the journal. It's something on Godzilla. It'll be fun. I know you'll love it. Uh, check it out when it goes up. And what else? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I got anything else to mention. That, that was a lot of stuff to mention, you have to admit. I'm busy. I feel like I'm, I feel so lazy. I feel like I never get anything done is the thing. And yet, objectively, clearly, I, I do accomplish something. So anyway, y'all have a wonderful day. Please take care of yourself. Uh, be well. Do well. Be kind to animals, small children, and just have a wonderful day.